Dear colleague, there's a world in which people don't let things happen. They make them happen. They don't put their dreams away in a drawer. They hold them tight in their hand. They jump into the fray, savor the risk, and make their mark. It's a world where every new day and every new challenge brings with it the opportunity to create a better future. Those who inhabit that place never live the same day twice, because they know it is always possible to improve something. People there feel they belong to that extraordinary world as much as that world belongs to them. They bring it to life with their work, they shape it with their own talent, they impress their values upon it in an indelible way. Maybe it won't be a perfect world and surely doing this is not easy. But there, no one is seated on the sidelines and the rhythm can be frenetic because these people are passionate, truly passionate about what they're doing. The ones who choose to live there do it because they believe that assuming responsibilities gives a more profound meaning to their work and their own lives. Welcome to that world. Welcome to Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. With this letter, the Italian-Canadian manager Sergio Marchione, CEO of Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, personally welcomed every employee of the company. Marchione doesn't need introductions. He was simply the most impactful businessman of our age in the automotive industry. He was the mind behind its two greatest turnarounds, the transformation of Fiat from the verge of bankruptcy into one of the fastest growing companies in the industry and the acquisition, rescue and return to profitability of Chrysler after the financial crisis of 2007. He was the CEO of FCA after the merger of Fiat and Chrysler, the chairman of Ferrari and Maserati and prior to that the CEO of the multinational companies CNH Industrial and SGS. His frank approach in dealing with unpopular issues made him the target of much criticism and diverging opinions, but certainly his results and the extraordinary growth of Fiat Chrysler automobiles speaks volumes about the depth of his business acumen and the success of his approach to management. Time magazine listed him in the 100 most influential people of 2012, and the British Financial Times defined him as simply one of the boldest business leaders of his generation. As you can imagine, much has been said and written about Marchione, about his legendary rescue of Fiat and Chrysler, his management style, his relationship with unions, his ties with Italy, or his momentous 2015 talk, Confessions of a Capital Junkie, where he launched the idea of a global reconfiguration and consolidation of the automotive industry. I genuinely invite you to find out more about him, his positions, his strategy, and his roles beyond the aura of legend or criticism that surrounds him. What I want to explore with you today instead is his intellectual profile as a corporate nomad, as he described himself, the relationship between his formation as a philosopher and his management style, and the character of the world that his letter outlines. The object of our conversation, then, is the added value of philosophy to business and the impact of a humanistic formation on the creation of an original entrepreneurial mindset or leadership style. In order to tackle these questions, we need to go back to 1966, when a 14-year-old kid from Abruzzo moved with his parents and his sister Luciana from his hometown, Chieti, to Ontario, where his aunt, Anna Zucon had emigrated a few years before. Sergio's father was originally from Chieti, but in the 1930s he had moved to Istria, a peninsula on the Gulf of Trieste, which was then part of Italy, to work as a carabiniere police officer. There he had met his then wife, Maria Zucon. With the outbreak of World War II, however, the region became a battleground of conflicting political groups and ethnicities, and both Maria's father and brother were killed by Yugoslav partisans and German soldiers, respectively, in 1943. After the Yugoslav army occupied the region at the end of the war, Maria followed Sergio's father back to Chieti, and her sister Anna instead escaped to Canada, which in the post-war years had become a key destination for Italian immigrants. As the 14-year-old Sergio and his sister Luciana crossed the Atlantic in 1966, they were part of this story exiles scarred by their past 
and in search of new horizons. It is in Ontario that Marchione's real story begins. It was there that his world started to take shape. In the private decision to not just accept being an outsider, but rather to embrace the new uncharted territory that the journey opened. The pillars of his early life in Toronto were his family, his studies, and lots of imagination. Even though I listed it last, imagination represents for every immigrant a key road builder and an essential resource in embracing challenges boldly. After breaking the circle of routine, imagination is the fuel for a new journey, the stamina of a new impulse to chart the unknown, as emblematically summed up by Doc's famous line to Marty McFly at the end of Back to the Future. Roads? Where we're going, there are no roads. So this endless openness and audacity of the outsider is the core mindset of the immigrant, but also of the adventurer, the explorer, the entrepreneur. In nurturing and grounding this drive, Sergio's family and his studies were fundamental resources. From his father, who continued to serve in the Carabinieri, he learned self-discipline, respect, a sense of the law and honor. Not by chance, in his last public appearance before his sudden death in 2018, Marchione gifted his father's police division with a brand new Jeep, stressing the importance of the values he instilled in him. From his studies, he learned dedication and imagination. His older sister Luciana, who became a professor of Italian literature and a scholar of Natalia Ginsburg's work prior to her death at a young age, instilled in him the sense of education as a powerful tool to emerge in the new context. His bachelor's degree in philosophy at St. Michael's College of the University of Toronto gave him a critical perspective shift and a new ability to think outside the box. He would then continue studying, first graduating from the law school at York University and then receiving an MBA at the University of Windsor. But philosophy admittedly represented for him the foundation of everything that came after. I chose philosophy because I felt in that moment that it was an important thing for me. He would comment in a 2011 lecture at the University of Bologna. After listing all the different roads he took next, he then added, I don't know if philosophy made me a better lawyer or CEO, but it opened my eyes. It opened my mind to other things. Herein lies the core of Marchione's vision as a manager. It opened my eyes. It opened my mind. Meaning, it enabled me to see the deeper structure of things beyond their surface, to postulate alternative ways of thinking, to extract substantive value from raw data, to pursue moral virtue, to give shape to an imaginary path, a road, in the uncharted land beyond the frontier of one's own limit. As also seen in Marchione's later Confessions of a Capitalist Junkie, this philosophical vision would allow him to call the industry to a moral choice between mediocrity or fundamentally changing paradigm, and forge what he defined a dispassionate look at the industry from the outside using insider knowledge. So how did this philosophical vision impact his management style? What added value does philosophy bring to an industry leader? If we think about it in broader terms, business is not just an elaborate network of transactions, but rather an existential or philosophical condition, as indicated in the suffix ness. We are because we are busy. Whether we live a few hours or days or months, we find ourselves busy looking for answers to our material needs and to our intellectual thirst to know why. The 19th century poet Giacomo Leopardi explains our condition of busyness well in his night song of a wandering shepherd in Asia by comparing the flock's life to his own. Sheep can hang out all day, he notices, but as soon as I lie down, boredom assails me. So when we think of Sergio Marchione, then we have to take into account this dual idea of business as both the ability to pursue material growth, wealth, and the tireless effort to empower or augment the human experience. In this sense, it is significant that the words value and capital apply to both the industrial and the cultural realm. Against this backdrop, a defining feature of Marchione's work as manager is the idea of the industrial company as a shared venture. 
In a 2011 interview with Ezio Mauro, then director of Repubblica, he offered an example of this approach. He explained that after being appointed CEO of Fiat in 2004, he used to visit its production sites in Mirafiori, Turin, during the weekends when no one was around, just to assess the conditions of showers, restrooms, and dining rooms. I changed all of it, he stated, adding, how can I ask a quality product of workers and have them live in such a degraded factory? It is this vision of industry as a common work, as a shared industriousness or busyness aimed at bearing fruit that made him a loyal and trustworthy leader. Even in tough negotiations, whether with the US government to sell the bankrupt automaker Chrysler to Italy's Fiat or with Italian trade unions to set conditions for retaining production in Italy despite higher manufacturing costs. In dealing with his management role, Marchione often presented himself as a fixer, obsessed with bringing projects to completion. But in his position as a leader, he actually behaved like a designer, an enabler, and the sharer of a vision, acting not as a ball hog, but rather as a playmaker. Instead of dwelling on niceties, good intentions, or strategic kindness, he constructed his success on trust, execution, and the ability to anticipate changes. Profit, as both a monetary and human benefit, is in fact born of accountability, transparency, zealous cooperation, and also disruptive imagination, as a tool to break through compartmentalization and enable employees to keep growing, avoid default mode, and share in the fruits of a common work. Marchione's challenging and often blunt way of sharing his vision, which was born of his experience as both an insider and an outsider, comes from the philosophical premise that, in his words, everything is manageable. Or we could paraphrase that everything can be the ingredient of a truly human business. What philosophy gave him was the ability to read events within a broader scenario and the flexibility to adapt to changing situations. There is no point where we cannot begin an itinerary of knowledge. There is no situation that can prevent us from starting a path. This is the kernel of the world that Marchione described in the letter to his employees. The core of any enterprise is the awareness of being part of this world where a common good can be built only over time with dedication and effort and not magical solutions, and most importantly, with honor and virtue. In a 2010 talk addressed to young people, Marchione identified virtue as the key engine of industrial and professional success. Virtue as a call to see a broader horizon to our actions than the immediate results or outcome. In this path to virtue, to fruit-bearing profit, to human fulfillment, what is needed is a great deal of preparation and improvisation. The manager needs to know the facts, manage situations, and prepare the conditions for a sustainable path. But at the same time, like a good storyteller, he or she must be able to tweak a plot line, follow changing scenarios, and improvise in uncharted territory. Innovation is born of this ability to disrupt a plan and in the capacity to imagine or anticipate what's next. This is the core of what critics called Marchione's jazz approach to management. In a jam session, only self-discipline and well-studied rigor can create the ground to powerfully improvise, swiftly change direction and creatively shape new melodies. This is also outlined in his last recommendation to his managers, where he simply stated that in his management style, there are no notes, nor an instruction manual. Every indication is simply temporary. The fertile terrain of these improvisational skills is cultural imagination. In this sense, literature and philosophy represent training sites for exploring the unknown, negotiating difficult situations in a safe space, testing solutions, and shaping a path. Without his imagination, vision, honor, and sense of the common good, all humanistic values, it would be hard to understand Marchione's remarkable success. Without this dual idea of business as solid execution and a world of meaning, it would be hard to explain his grasp of investors and workers. Marchione once said that at the start of his career, he would ask investors if they loved Italy, 
often obtaining long and generous answers about their most beloved locales and foods, only to be followed by embarrassed replies to his next question about whether they would invest in Italy. How then did fiat become the terminal of the investor's interest? Why is it really worth investing in Italy? Marchione's capacity to be trustworthy and accountable is certainly one factor, but what made him persuasive was exactly his world. What he defined in the letter to his employees as a busy space of solid transactions and meaningful interactions. In this sense, beyond his role as a fixer, we have to look at Marchione as an adventurer, a visionary and a philosopher reconfigured business from what he defined as an addiction to capital into a restless world, where human and monetary value is constantly created for those who are willing to walk a path. Like his employees and colleagues, all of us are invited to inhabit that world. Thank you very much for watching and I invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel or to the webpage www.italianinnovators.com to receive notifications of new episodes. You can also follow me on my LinkedIn profile or at Instagram at Italian Innovators for additional materials about the show. Thanks again. Arrivederci e alla prossima.